Howdy, it's Kyle talking about the best and worst run cities in the US. This is not going to be a ranking of mine for these cities, but rather a response to an article that I read on the financial website WalletHub talking about the best and worst run cities in the country. And when I first saw the title of this article from these guys, I was thinking, well, this is going to be something. And then I saw their list and it's something all right. So in this video, I wanted to discuss some of the fatal flaws with this particular study, but also with studies like this in general and why you shouldn't get geography information from financial publications like this. But I'll also go over a couple of cities that I do feel are poorly run, but it's not going to be a ranking because this is really a type of topic where you really just can't find an accurate way to rank them. But let's take a look at this article talking about the best and worst run cities in the country. So here's the article that I was referring to. And again, it's from the Wallet Hub website. And they're normally good for financial advice, stock market, retirement kind of stuff. But they will eventually dabble into geography. And that's where things can get a little bit dicey with what they're talking about. So ultimately, what they're, here are the main findings here. Here's the list of the best cities, best run cities. So you can see they have Nampa and Boise, Idaho as one, two. And seemingly random cities going down the list. I'll try to scroll fairly slow. Um, last time I did something like this, people were got a few complaints of scrolling too fast. Uh, but it's kind of a almost like a random list of cities, different sizes, some are suburbs, but all different parts of the country. Um, get no real rhyme or reason, no real correlations here. I'm going to scroll fast to the bottom. Close your eyes, kids. Um, so the very bottom, Washington, San Francisco, New York, and Chattanooga. So when I saw this, I was like, what? And I saw who was at the top, and I was like, what? So I wanted to go over what are the main problems with this and why this is just a very poorly done article and research. So let's take a look at their experts. Here are the people that were part of uh, this process. So they have four. Uh, the first guy is an economist with a political think tank, and the other three are professors of political science. Um, they're all pretty old, too. Uh, so no geographers, no sociologists, no urban planners. I'm not sure how you could possibly do a study like this without having at least a single urban planner. Uh, but you got three poli-sci guys, so I guess that's what uh, they chose to go with. Um, so the things they're looking at are their main methodology. They're looking at financial stability, education, health, safety, economy, and infrastructure. Those sound like exactly the things you think would you would talk about when determining what are the best and worst run cities in the country. However, where they weight the things is where you start to see some of the problems. So for example, finance, this whole thing is 100 points total. Financial stability is 16, with the Moody's credit rating being by far the most important thing that they consider for this study. So basically they're saying is, you know, just how much money you have and how much debt you have is by far the most important indicator of whether or not the city is well run. So right off the bat, there's a massive problem because you're, you have in this list of 150 cities, you have many that are suburbs and many that are the main city of a metro area, including very different sized cities. So you cannot possibly compare the realities of what Nampa, Idaho is going through versus San Francisco or Washington. So Nampa and other suburbs that are on this list are suburbs. They cannot exist on their own. They piggyback off of the larger city of the metro area in which they're part of. So you don't have to do all the same things in a suburb. So for example, Boise has the downtown, the central business district with all the extra shopping and things associated with having the big central business district. You have a big university there. You have the event center. You have things happening in the city. You have people coming into that town for various events. Nampa is a bedroom community and really nothing else. So you, you just can't compare the two realities of each other because Nampa doesn't have to worry about the public works and all the other types of things that the bigger city has to deal with. And when you're talking about the credit rating, another problem is that the cities that this study says are the worst are ones that generate way more revenue than they receive. So for example, San Francisco Bay Area 
has a GDP of about $600 billion. That's more than 38 states, 12 of which have more people. And as a result, it doesn't get all that money back. So I'm from one of the poorest parts of California, one of the poorest parts of the country, and it doesn't generate that much revenue, but a lot of its funding comes in the way of subsidies from the Bay Area or Los Angeles or San Diego or other places along the coast. I can't really find a, how you can say San Francisco is poorly run when it generates so much revenue that it subsidizes places like where I'm from that don't generate enough revenue. So if a city has excess money to give to others, that's a pretty good sign that it's actually run pretty well. And you look at the case of New York City Metro, another one that's New York is low on this list. New York City Metro was $1.9 trillion GDP. The entire state of Texas has two trillion. So Texas has 30 million people, New York Metro 20 million. So again, New York puts a lot of money in all of our wallets across the country. So you cannot say that New York City is poorly run when it's able to do that. If it wasn't generating enough revenue and needed, needed welfare to balance its budget, then that would be poorly run. But if it's doling out welfare to places that can't balance its budget, that's a pretty good indicator that it's actually quite well run. You look at the number of major companies headquartered in some of these places. Uh, again, those are the types of things that the, the main city has to deal with, but the suburbs don't. So let's scroll down a little bit more. Um, education, <clears throat> certainly very important uh, statistic. Um, although I think high school graduation rate at five points is way too, that's way too weighted. Uh, certainly important, but to put that much weight on it, I think is pretty ridiculous. Um, healthcare. Now, these are all very important statistics, and yet none of them have really anything to do with local leadership. So, none of these. I mean, hospital beds per capita, quality of public hospitals. Cities don't run hospitals, they're run by county health departments, state health departments, or they're private. So, if there are a few beds or they're not good hospitals, that's not because of the mayor or the city council, that's because of the county health state health or whatever. So again, all of these are important statistics, COVID stuff. But again, your COVID numbers are going to be, to put that on a city is pretty ridiculous because say, for example, San Francisco has a high COVID rate, but how many of those people are people that live outside of the city that come into the city to work? So, so these are all very important stats, but they're, none of those are reflective of um, city leadership you get the safety. Now these are important. These are ones that a lot of these local leadership can have a say in, but I don't like, look how much weight they put on motor vehicle fatalities per capita. That's twice as much weight as they put on pedestrians. Um, very, very strange. And the perception of safety is kind of weird. Uh, I didn't, they didn't put much weight on it, which is good because I'm not really sure how you, you judge that one. Um, Going down to the economy. The economy is, for a lot of people, the most important thing. Um, again, this is Wallet Hub, so financial stuff is going to be the most important things to them. However, a lot of these things are not reflective of city leadership. They're reflective more of perhaps the overall metro area system. All the, city, all the cities and towns of a metro area is one system. They can't operate on their own. So things like unemployment and income growth, these are things more regional or statewide and not just an individual city because two cities directly adjacent to each other are not going to have massively different numbers like this. So that's why I'm going to go back to the list of cities. You're going to see ones that are basically right next to each other, show up right next to each other on the list because so many of these are going to be very similar. Um, and you also notice how studies like this will always do median household income adjusted for cost of living which is fine, That's that, you should do that, but they never do house values adjusted for wages. So you'll see studies like this adjust things for cost of living, but never adjust things for wages. So be, be careful about that. Um, and also what's frustrating with this is some of the ones that I do think the city can have a say in are ones they give least weight on. Growth of number and number of businesses, that is something that the city leadership can have a say in and it gets a whopping one point on this thing but underemployment which is more regional or state is one point 
So again, um, another one, building permit growth. That can also be very reflective of leadership and they put very little weight on that. So I think they're putting little weight on things that are important and then five points on motor vehicle fatalities. That's who designed, anyway. So you, now you get down to infrastructure and pollution. Um, now a big problem that I have with a lot of studies like this is that the people that done did these and for you know those four expert guys I showed you at the be at beginning, they're all suburban guys. They all live out in the suburbs. So, you know, what is important to them isn't what's important to people that live in the city. And these categories are the ones that really matter to people that live in the city. So quality of the roads, commute time, transit access, traffic congestion, walking ability, biking ability, recreation, internet access, water quality. I mean, these are the things that actually matter. Look how little weight they give to any of these. I mean, it's crazy, but they give all the extra weight to things such as, you know, unemployment and things that have more to do with the region. And these things actually have to do with how well run a city is. These are the actual ones that matter and they're putting so little weight on them, which is very frustrating. And again, the motor vehicle fatalities was almost five points, walking two points. Traffic congestion, 0.7. So the categories themselves are not so bad, but the weighting is really quite ridiculous. And that's kind of just a general idea or a general feeling as to why I don't think you should be getting geography information from financial websites. And you might be thinking that, you know, maybe money is the most important thing to you and your decision to move somewhere. And it might, might very well be. But these financial sources... These, these financial sources often don't know what type of criteria to even put in their algorithm. They look at the, the final number, just plug in these numbers and, you know, the result is how we're going to rank it here, but we're not going to look at what are the actual criteria being put into the algorithm. You have to have some type of subjectivity, some type of geographical knowledge or urban planning knowledge to be able to accurately do a list like this. So, I mean, just look at this list. I'm going to kind of go through this a little slowly and just mostly big cities here. Um, bigger cities have to dole out more to smaller rural areas. Um, and we got Cheyenne. How can you possibly even compare Cheyenne to some of these other ones? It's just, it's, it's a small town. You can't compare it. Riverside is essentially a suburb. Fresno, I mean... Fresno and Sacramento are about the same on this list. If you're from California, you know they're not about the same. Um, I mean, Fresno, I don't think it's as bad as people say, but it ain't great. Um, so you'll see a lot of places that are pretty close to each other end up on this list. So, I mean, Modesto is right there as well. I mean, how can Stockton be 100? How can Stockton be above anybody? <laughs> Stockton is notoriously poorly run. Um, but apparently their statistics don't meet the algorithm's negativity. So it's kind of right in the middle, but it shouldn't be near the middle. Charleston, West Virginia, HUD of San Jose. I mean, these are, again, just, it's ridiculous. And Bakersfield's above both of them. Yeah, sure. New Orleans above Salt Lake City. Yeah, sure. Why not? So this, it just doesn't make sense. And when you see this as a geographer or an urban planner or somebody, you see this list, and you're like, how can this possibly be? Gary, I mean, come on, man. So, I mean, Jackson, Mississippi, I'd say is one of the gnarliest cities in the country. And for it to be in the top half on this is pretty sad. Off the top of my head, the one I can think of might be what I would call the worst run city would be Jacksonville, Florida, because they were dealt a really good hand. I mean, in a poker analogy, they were dealt a full house and basically folded. They have incredible geography. They're in the part of the state that gets the fewest number of landfall hurricanes um, you have really hot humid summers but unlike peninsular florida it gets you know dare i say chilly a little bit in the winter time so you have a little bit of a reprieve from all that heat and humidity um, beautiful beaches there's a lot going on in jacksonville and all of the 
development has been in the past 40, 50 years. There wasn't much of anything there before that. And so all the development there has been since we already knew that, you know, wider interstates going farther and farther out, more suburbs, bigger houses, farther and farther out. We Jacksonville was developed after we already knew all that stuff was bad. And so that's why I would say a, a place like that is poorly run when, again, you were dealt a fantastic hand and then just blew it. So I want to end this video with some financial advice from a geographer. You should always buy stock in big companies, always just giant corporations. They didn't get to be big because they don't know what they're doing. They always make sound decisions. So you should always buy stock in just giant companies and you should never buy stock in small startups. You know, they're going to go nowhere. All right. Because if they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't be small startups. So you're just wasting your money with investing in small companies, always invest in big companies. And don't worry about planning for retirement. They keep raising Social Security. By the time you retire, you'll be you'll be fine. They're going to pay you so much. So don't don't worry about all that. Buy a big company stock, never small company stock. Don't worry about retirement. So there's your financial advice from a geographer. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about geography. I'm talking about cities and states and ranking them in all kinds of categories, talking about cross country road tripping. I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd, so everything comes from a little more nerdy type perspective. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out.